Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Domenico Grasso, the Chancellor of the University of Michigan Dearborn, and I'd like to welcome you to this special event. This is a, uh, a nice room, but very awkward room to do a presentation in because you're going to be shifting your head uh, quite often here. But uh, we have, a, uh, as I said, a special event today because, as you know, uh, since I've arrived, we've hosted these thought leader series and we brought in internationally recognized individuals on various topics. This is the first time we're hosting a thought leader <clears throat> series that is combined with our DEI initiative. So this is a combined thought leader DEI uh, presentation. So of course it is one uh, an internationally recognized individual and it's specifically focused on all of our efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion, the whole concept of inclusive excellence. And I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker today because uh, not only is she a distinguished scholar and very successful administrator, but she has <clears throat> some roots to our institution, writ largely, of course. Uh, it is uh, Dr. Lynn Wooten, who is the ninth president of Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts, Simmons University, right? It used to be Simmons College, that's when I grew up. Now it's Simmons University. When did that change? 2019. 2019, so it's a relatively recent change. So you'll forgive me for blowing that. Uh, uh, president of Simmons University in Boston, Massachusetts. She uh, came from a very interesting uh, background. She started off with a bachelor's degree at North Carolina A&T North Carolina and then went to Duke for a, an MBA at Fu Fuca, I, Fu Fuqua? I can never pronounce that. And I have a problem with Duke because they're tending to steal some of our best faculty members now because we just lost Jerry Lynch who was uh, head of civil engineering in the Ann Arbor, went there to be dean of engineering, and then most recently, Alec Gallimore, who was dean of engineering here, who went to be provost, or is going to be provost at the Duke. So uh, we have a nice connection with them in going in the wrong direction at the moment. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Lynn came to Ann Arbor and got a PhD uh, at the University of Michigan at what is now the Ross School. And then she was on the faculty at U of M Ann Arbor for about 20 years, uh, which is a, a significant amount of time to spend at school. So I hope that, and her husband is still on the faculty at, uh, at Ross, so I hope she has deep roots here and, uh, and doesn't try to steal any of our faculty members <laughs> at Simmons College or staff members. Uh, and uh, then from here, she went off to be uh, Dean of Management at Cornell University, uh, where she spent a few years. And then from there, she became president of Simmons College. And it, I have to say, and I'm sure you appreciate, it's only a special person that can jump from a dean's position to a presidency. It Typically, you have to go through uh, provosts level experience and then move on. But when, you, when people see talent, they capture it. And clearly Simmons saw talent in Lynn and captured it. We're fortunate she's gonna be speaking about an important topic today, which is the C, C session. I, you probably can't say that fast. Very, yeah. She session. Uh, you can't say that fast. Uh, 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 unless you're practicing for Pygmalion or something, uh, uh, a rendition of that. But um, it's going to be an, an interesting conversation about all the impacts that have influenced women disproportionately, uh, not just during the recession, but I think over various uh, time periods in our society. So without dragging this on any longer for you, I will bring up the star of the show, Dr. and President Lynn Wooten. Thank you for that introduction, and, and it, it is an honor to be home. I do definitely think of myself as a Wolverine, being married to one, having a child who went to law school there, and um, being on the faculty for 20 years. So um, good afternoon. 
I've been studying women since I got my PhD, and then I become president of a women's college in the middle of a pandemic. And so it became a live case study and a live research project for me to understand women, and in particular what we call the secession. So I'm going to talk about the secession, but I'm also going to talk about how we can turn the secession around. So the roadmap today is I'm going to set the context, because everybody's saying, what is the secession? I'm going to talk briefly about my 25 plus years of research and what I've learned about the secession. And in particular, I'm then going to pivot and say, OK, how do we create institutions and workplaces where women can arrive and thrive, especially since this is one of the last days of Women's History Month? So context setting. I don't know what you did in the pandemic, but we played a lot of Scrabble in our house, and we played a lot of Wordle. And we were noticing that our vocabulary was increasing. I mean, when you're in Ithaca for months at a time, you do a lot of things because you're isolated. So we started to learn new words, bubble and cancel culture and PPE and coronavirus and wokeness. Um, at the same time while I was wrapping up at Cornell during the pandemic and becoming the president of a women's college, I was reading a lot about women in the workplace. And I started to hear this word, the she session. And I knew early on in my career I had written a paper about women-friendly work, and I started to say, what is this she session? Did anyone else hear this word in 2020 and start to think about what is the she session? Anybody else hear it? Okay. That's because you weren't isolated in Ithaca, so you didn't have to do all these things that I had to do. So it's a now, and it really is what we saw is no time in America's history where women have left the workforce like we saw in 2020. You know, when we've had war, We've had other economic crises, usually women stay. But all of a sudden, we were seeing this mass exodus. Recently, I was at MIT with Elizabeth Warren, and she was talking about when you look at our workforce problems now, one third of it is because of the secession. Women got tired. They got burned out. They decided that it was not working in the workplace. Um, in the news, there's a she session. Women worry more about jobs, four times less confident than men, a LinkedIn survey says. She session, the pandemic's impact on women in the workplace. The recession, AKA the she session, is hitting women hard. Why the she session will last after the pandemic? These were all topics that we were thinking about and people were writing about, uh, but we were paying attention to a lot of different things. OK, so you look at the data. For those of you who like data, I know Domenico is an engineer. The people are like, well, does the data really show this? And so the data really did show, when you looked at it right, women were leading at higher rates than men. But it wasn't that the rates were that significant. It was that this was the first time in an economic crisis, or even when we had war, where we were intentionally seeing women leave the workplace. And in particular, OK, you look at all women. About 6.1% were exiting. But when you start to look at women of color, when you look at millennials, when you look at Gen Z, and when you look at people with less bachelor degrees, we were having, in my other line of research, what I call a smoldering crisis. Something was going on here. And in particular, OK, people are tired and burned out. But the scarier thing is, if we continue to see this pattern, were we going to see all the gains that women had made over our life course to really have gender equality and gender equity. So beyond the unemployment data, what are some of the things that were scaring us? Well, one is, is that the glass ceiling on the concrete ceiling. If we were having a she session, it's going to be very challenging to continue to shatter those concrete and glass ceilings. The other thing is, is that this leaky pipeline, and especially all of us in higher ed, I'm going to talk about the leaky pipeline. In most professions, women start on e very on equality, and then they drop all the pipelines, so they decide to exit. Um, other things are, I don't understand as a society, I've been studying this for 30 years, why we're still struggling with women and caring responsibility. So caring responsibility, juggling many balls, the wage gap, all of these things we're really kind of smoldering in the ripple effects of what we're seeing in the secession. OK, let's talk about the corporate pipeline, and then I'll comment on higher ed and the work I've done with the EOS Foundation. Uh, you know, most people don't know me. I actually wanted to be a home economics major. I thought I'd be the next black Martha Stewart. 
<laughs> but I grew up with aunts in the corporate sector. One of my aunts was an IBM executive, a word MBA. Another aunt was the chief um, person for IRS in Philadelphia. And back in the 80s, they said to me, you know what, Lynn, you don't have to go into home ec. Why don't you go into business? And that's how I ended up in business. And even now, business is one of the top majors in the country. And when you look at gender parity, women are starting out. So when you look at entry levels in the corporate suite, 48% of them are starting out. Uh, but if you look at by the time you get to the C-suite, we're down to 24%. This is that leaky pipeline. And management, we get to 41. By VP, it's 30%. So something is happening in addition to this recession in the corporate sector. Um, we always celebrate women CEOs, and I've spent a lot of time in my career studying them. And so this is a big issue in the corporate sector. I will forward this data so that you can see it, but the EOS Foundation data really is what got me. And for those of us who are in higher ed, you should really look at that report. Because it's one thing to say, you know what, Lynn? The corporate sector, okay, yes, we know that Wendell struggled there. But it's the same trend in higher education. If you look at, for example, men presidents versus female presidents, if you look at academic deans, if you look at tenured full professors, we start out with the same level in the PhD program, but something's happening. We're not getting tenured. We're not becoming academic deans. We're not becoming presidents of universities. So we're still seeing this trend here about why women are not arriving and thriving. And as me taking over as president of a women's college, I wanted to know more about the why and the how. So I've used the last three years as a platform, one, to write a book about a women arriving and thriving, but also to have a public discourse, to write op-eds about the glass ceiling, about the she session, about how women lead differently. And I'm going to share some of those things today with you. So the first thing I want to say is, is that what I've learned from the She Session is before the, before the pandemic, I thought we were on this trajectory. Really, I thought I was going to leave a great world for my daughter and my women students. But I realized that success has leaps and bounds. We go back, we go forward. But what can we do about that? And what can we learn from research? And then what can each of us do and practice to be successful? Okay. So I um, got my PhD from Michigan in 1995, have been studying women in the workforce since then, and looked at a variety of things, and a couple things have emerged. What has grounded my research is the quote from Zora Neale Hurston. Research is really this formalized curiosity. It's poking, it's prying, it's a purpose. And this is why I've been so passionate about understanding the organizational systems and the macro environment where women can arrive and thrive. So I am considered an action researcher. I spend a lot of time in the field. I observe a problem or opportunity. I collect data, and then I try to ground it in theory and develop new theories. But beyond being theoretical and being mainly a qualitative and a survey researcher, my entire research career has been about actionable solutions, and it's about how others can learn from my research. I've had three research programs that have made me start to think about what women can do and how we can create cultures of arriving and thriving and why we struggle with these problems. I've studied crisis leadership. I've studied diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. And then I was the co-director at the Ross School for the Center for Positive Organizations. And so all of these have fed upon who I am as a researcher. So crisis leadership, what have I learned about women in this succession from crisis leadership? You know, we tend to ignore things. And the she session is an example of a smoldering crisis. We didn't pay attention to all the things that made women leave the workplace and make them struggle. And good crisis leadership is about signal detection. It's about planning and preparing for a crisis. And then it's about how do I contain it? What can I do as a leader for a crisis? And then how do I go into recovery mode? So a lot of what I've studied in the crisis leadership domain has looked at why organizations struggle with women. Why do we see sexual misconduct lawsuits? Why do we see gender discrimination? And if organizations took crisis leadership seriously, looking for the signals, changing systems, and learning, we probably would be better at leading and creating organizations where women could thrive. 
Uh, my first paper out of grad school I was so happy about is I studied women-friendly organizations, and it was published in sex roles. And what I realized is, is that environmental pressure is something we call institutional theory. Plus, if organizations really believe women can have a competitive advantage, they are the best type of organizations. So organizations that invest in using women at a differentiation, leveraging their knowledge, and creating policies and practices where women can thrive. And then finally, in the positive organizational scholarship and diversity realm, this is one of the books I edited, to be successful with DEI in general, but especially for the topic today, it requires you to be a learning organization. And each of you are everyday leaders in your organization, and the question becomes, what are you doing for personal mastery? Everybody has to be responsible for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and elevating women in the workplace. But we know in addition to personal mastery, my research talks about team mastery, the collective knowledge of a team, and how the various teams and functional areas advance diversity, equity, inclusion. And then we have to think systemly. And I know the whole university system is also going through a visioning session. I know there's a lot of high level stuff done at the university on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you have to have mental models. The work of advancing women does not happen unless individuals and organizations have mental models. What do I mean by a mental model? You have to have a theory of change. If I'm going to do A, how am I going to do it, and what is A going to produce? And so the best practices for women in the workplace, they're mental models. Okay. Now I want to go to the individual level and talk about my latest book. So when I joined Simmons, um, Deloitte, Janet Fowley is the managing partner at Deloitte, and the person who runs our Institute for Inclusive Leadership, they had this ideal that there must be practices where women can arrive and thrive. What are those best practices and how do we share them with the world so we see more representation in the C-suite? We see more university presidents. We see more healthcare presidents and nonprofit organizations in government. So we came up with this ideal that we were going to interview women, we were going to ground it in theory, and we were going to try to understand what the practices are. So there's Janet, my co-author, who's at Deloitte. She brought the corporate sector experience. Susan has been a consultant with Linkage before she became a Simmons. She brought more of the consultant framework, and I brought the framework from the academy. And in particular, we spent the first year, 2021, really interviewing woman, women to understand what are those practices and doing this qualitative method to say, okay, if women are going to thrive and arrive, what does it look like? So what we did was we interviewed women from all over, different industries, different sectors, different types of companies, nonprofit, to understand what does it take to arrive and thrive and came up with seven themes. After we came up with those seven things, we went back to the field and validated it. And the person who wrote the foreword to the book is Andrea Noye. Andrea Noye is the first um, Asian, I think the second Asian American to be president of a Fortune 500 company. And in particular, I'm going to show you a video clip where she talks about her own journey of what it took to arrive and thrive and challenges all of us to invest in women in the workplace. As a little girl growing up in India, Indra knew he had big dreams, and it was the support of her family that allowed her to soar. Despite cultural expectations for women at the time, Indra's parents prioritized her education. The belief was a good education is the foundation for your future. How did they balance the cultural tug of war of making sure as a woman you were going to eventually find someone to get married versus education and career. You know, one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator. But I was among the early group of women to go to college, to go into business schools. And in my family, it was like, let the girls dream. Indra's dream led her to the United States and the Yale School of Management. She graduated in 1980 and spent the next decade climbing the corporate ladder at a time women were rarely seen at the top. When you joined PepsiCo in 1994, 15 of the top 15 executives were American men. Not one Fortune 500 company had a female CEO. You are a woman, an immigrant, a person of color. What was it like sometimes in those boardrooms when you didn't see faces that looked like you? It actually made me work harder and better because I'd feel like people are looking at me like she must not belong here. So I always came over prepared. I would quickly establish that I was a force to be reckoned with. 
that I deserved a seat at the table. It wasn't long before she sat at the head of the table. In 2006, she was named chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, but she already had another important title, mom. Her success at work meant sacrificing time with her family, her husband Raj, and their two daughters, Preetha and Tara. So when I became CEO, my kids were all young. So it was a difficult time, believe me. But the good thing is my office was 10 minutes from home and the young one's school was 10 minutes from the office. So I lived in that triangular bubble, if you want to call it that. Trust me, a lot of us can relate. <laughs> <laughs> that made a huge difference, Chanel, because if there was a problem in school, I just ran out. I didn't care what meeting I was in, I ran out. I know so many women who feel like, okay, if I mastered my work today, then I feel like I failed at home. And if I was all in at home, I feel like I failed at work. And I feel like there are a lot of people who feel like they just can't balance it all. It's a real challenge. And I do not even use the word balance anymore. It's like juggling. You just have to juggle everything. I think the best you can do is to say, at the end of the day, I'm going to do the best I can for my family, the best I can for my job. There was a time that really kind of pulled on my heartstrings where your daughter wrote you a letter. And the note goes, uh, Mom, please, please, please come home. I love you more if you came home. Please, 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 please. Did it just break your heart? Break my heart is an understatement, but that's reality. It's hard, and you do the best you can. Inger believes that accessible and affordable child care will not only help ease the balancing act for families, but is also a win for society at large. The big blessing was, since I moved up in the corporate career, I had money to afford my own health. A lot of people today don't have it. Our frontline didn't have it during the pandemic. What has to change in order to make this a reality for so many women around the world? I think the first thing we have to do is when we talk about future of work, we have to just stop talking about technology and start to talk about families, family builders, women. Women are 70% of the high school valedictorians. They graduate in college at 10 points higher than the men. We need these women in the workforce. There's hope. If you're a woman, dream big. The world needs you, the country needs you. We're going to create the system to support you. Thoughts when you heard her speak. What resonated with you? Family obligations. Family obligations. We know that even though men do do more, that women still do a lot of the family obligations. She tells the one story when she was appointed See, um, CEO of PepsiCo, and she came home, and her mother goes, I don't care if you've been appointed CEO, we need milk, go out and get milk. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the reality. Other things um, that resonated about that video. So, one of the things I hear more about is do you try to balance or do you try to integrate? Yes. And I talk a lot about in my own research, it's integrate. And for me, and I've, I've had debates with other colleagues about it, but for me, it really is try to integrate because balance is just too hard. I joked even my investor trip speech, I said, you know, my kids thought that conferences were vacations because I was integrating. Every time I go to a research conference, I made it a vacation. You know, I did everything in Ann Arbor to make that integrative life. And so when I'm coaching young women and when I talk about being authentic in a few minutes, I talk a lot about being intentional about integration. So the seven impactful practices that I want to share with you today and that Andrea Noye writes in the foreword of the book are, do we create cultures where women can invest in their best self and what does that look like? How can you be authentic? And part of being authentic is living an integrative life. Number three is the systems we need to cultivate courage. Four, fostering resiliency. And then five is inspiring a bold vision. Six is creating a healthy team environment, and then seven is committing to the work of the inclusive leader. So investing in your best self, and this is gonna be the high level speed thing that we usually I teach over a week. What does that look like? Um, one of the people we interviewed was Sandy Fenwick. Sandy Fenwick was the CEO of Boston Children's Hospital. She also happens to be a Simmons alum. And the quote that we have in the book is, she says, if you wish to be on a journey of significance, you need to invest in and then lead from your best self. The only way you can really arrive and thrive, and especially for women, is, is that showing up to be your best self and knowing who your best self is. Yes, we all have weaknesses and we have jobs that don't play to our entire strengths, 
but the way to really thrive is to be your best self. So in the book, we talk about this notion about creating workplace contexts for people to be their best self. So it starts with understanding your strengths, your superpowers, and your values. It then also is what brings you joy and vitality in the workplace is so important. And how can you create value? If you know who your best self is and you know your strengths, then you're in the right job in the right place and you're thinking about the possibilities for creating value. And context matters also. We have to think about what is the context we're creating for women, what are the industries you should go into, but part of being your best self is this intersection of context and your strengths. In the book, and many of you are probably familiar with some of these tools, how many of you have done Gallup strengths? You know your Gallup strengths, so that's good to see. A free one is the VIA. That's a free one that anyone can do. Gallup strengths, I think, is about $20 now. Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram. Deloitte has something called the Business Chemistry. At the Raw School, we have the Reflected Best Self. But each of you should start from the point of, if I'm going to thrive, I need to know my strengths and my best selves. And I need to be able to articulate them, and I need a work environment that supports and complements them. So that's practice number one, showing up to be your best self. Practice number two is being authentic. It's bringing your whole self. It's bringing your social identity to work. It's bringing your values to work. Um, it's bringing your style and your e unique executive presence. We interviewed Carla Harris. Carla Harris is at Morgan Stanley. Um, she's the vice chair. She's also on Walmart board and a number of boards. She is a trustee at Harvard Business School. And she talks about being authentic is your competitive advantage. It's that thing that nobody can do. It's that unique space. What is it that each of you can do, but especially women, that bring a competitive advantage in the workplace? Um, Carla has lots of energy, and she's gonna, I'm going to show you a clip about how she describes being authentic. You are your own competitive advantage. Nobody can be you the way that you can be you. So the last thing that you should, yes, yes. The last thing that you should ever do is to submerge that which is uniquely you. Anytime that you are trying to behave or speak in a way that is inconsistent with who you really are, you will create a competitive disadvantage for yourself. If your success depends upon your ability to successfully penetrate relationships, the easiest way to penetrate a relationship is to bring your authentic self to the table. If you bring your authentic self to the table, people will trust you. And trust is at the heart of any successful relationship. It is at the heart of any successful relationship. As quiet as it's kept, most people are not comfortable in their own skin. So when they see someone who is comfortable and confident in their own skin, they will gravitate towards you. They want some of that. That was a very interesting lesson for me to learn. When I first started in this business, I didn't want anybody to talk about the fact that I was a singer. I wanted to be known as a no-nonsense, hard-driving, analytical, quantitative investment banker. I'm not here to sing and dance, boys. Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to talk about that until I saw the client reaction. My colleagues would often go into a pitch with me and say, oh, this is Carla Harris, our capital markets banker. But what you really ought to know about Carla is that she's an amazing gospel singer. She's done three CDs, four sold out concerts at Carnegie Hall and blah, 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 blah. And there I was rolling my eyes until I saw the client reaction. Oh, you're a singer. Oh, I so admire people who can sing. I personally love to sing, but my family will only let me sing in the shower. And, <laughs> And maybe you could talk to my daughter about how she can integrate her love of the arts and her academics and blah, blah, blah. And there we were having a 15 minute meeting before the meeting. Are you with me? Take the lead. So when I sat down to pitch, 
They heard me with a different ear. They saw me through a different lens. I naturally differentiated myself from the other five bankers that would come in there and pitch that same IPO that afternoon because Carla Harris, the singer, was allowed to be in the room with Carla Harris, the banker. So anytime I walk into a new situation today, I bring Carla Harris, the investment banker, Carla Harris, the investment manager, Carla Harris, the prayer warrior, Carla Harris, the singer, Carla Harris, the writer, Carla Harris, the speaker, Carla Harris, the golfer, Carla Harris, the football fan. I bring all those Carlas to the table. So, how many organizations do you see people let you be authentic? That you can bring all your Carla Harris's to the table. What does that look like? What are your thoughts? She talked about the golf player, the footballer, the, the prayer warrior, this opera singer. What would the world be like if women could bring all of their authentic self? I see people shaking their heads. What is that going to take, you think? Thoughts? Well, I feel like in a lot of places, some of the Carlas are acceptable. You know, the sports Carla is acceptable. And, but some of the other ones, the singer, the prayer, the right. warrior, you know, it's a little harder to swallow. And I think there needs to be more openness and awareness of differences in the workplace and that it's OK to not have the same beliefs, but it's okay to still be on common ground for the business, even though we have those differences. Yeah. And we, so we have to have inclusive cultures where people feel like they belong. And we have to have this curiosity about the various roles people play in the workplace and outside of the workplace. Just thinking about Renee Brown and vulnerability. Yes. And how some organizations, individuals don't feel like they Vulnerable. And, and that's really important, especially during all of the crisis we've been through in the last couple years in higher ed. She talked about part of being authentic is being vulnerable and having cultures where people think they can be vulnerable. And it's really important. And she referenced Brene Brown. One of my favorite authors is Bill George, who was at the Harvard Business School. And he also talks about when we have environments where people can be authentic, they're on the pathway for their true north. And he outlines about five things. Self-aware. How do we become self-aware? Well, it goes back to knowing your strengths. And it knows what your developmental needs are also. Secondly, I strongly believe that all of us have to spend time knowing our values and principles and being able to articulate them and live them. Our motivations, what motivate us? When I had young children at home, my motivations are very different from an empty nester and someone who's concerned about her mother's well-being now. Leadership in arriving and thriving number four is not a solo sport. You need a support team. You need people that you can count on. Often when I'm coaching women, I'm saying, do you have a personal board of directors? And are there diverse people? And then finally, gone to the colleague's question there, Bill George is on a similar page with me. Designing work systems where women can live an integrative life. I'm somebody who, yes, I benefited from an income so I could have great child care. But when my children were young also, my daughter went to the UM Child Care Center. If it was a school day, lots of times, you saw my kids in my office doing homework. And so it's always living this integrative life. They had to be dragged along to my conferences, as I mentioned. How are we coaching women to live an integrative life? I talked about the importance of values. So part, practice number one, the tool I wanted you to do is know your strengths. From this practice, I want you to at least be able to articulate your values. You should be able to tell them. So if you ask me, my values are three things. I love to learn. I'm a geek for learning. I've been in school all my life and never left. I'm constantly reading a book. I was always that nerd. So learning is one of my values. It's my love language, too. Uh, my second one is the pursuit of excellence. I love things that are excellent. Yes, I'm that mom when you get a 99. I ask you about the one point. But the pursuit of excellence. And then my third value is Carla talks about Carla Harris, the, um, the prayer warrior. My third value is community. Every day I wake up thinking not only about my professional job, but how I can serve my community and the various civic organizations. I put a value on community. Now, how do you know you're being authentic with your values? 
One is you're walking to talk with your values when you look at your calendar and you can see you're doing things aligned with your values. Another one is that I've always told people to do is look at your phone at the end of the year. Look at the pictures you've taken. The pictures on your phone should speak to how you're living your values. And then once again, what are you speaking about and who are you surrounding yourself with? The final thing I want to talk about being authentic is, and when we're coaching women, we're working a lot is, is that your executive presence. It's that aura, it's that confidence, it's that interpersonal skill. Now, Andrea Noye and Carla Harris were two very different types of personality, but they both had executive presence and they were authentic. They brought their best selves. Um, they talked about their social identities. They talked about their values. They talked about how they lived an integrative life. They own their stage. And when you're authentic, executive presence comes natural because you're owning your stage. Number three, cultivating courage. How do we create workplaces and cultures where women can cultivate courage? Um, one of the people we interviewed was Ann Child. She's former CEO of AT&T Business. And she talks about courage is about introspection. It's knowing yourself, growing yourself, confronting your flaws, and admitting that you don't know everything. And a lot of times we see that women struggle with courage. And so in this particular practice, in this chapter in the book, we wanted tools and frameworks that really empowered women to be courageous leaders. One of the ones that I'm sharing with you is actually was designed by my um, colleague Sue Ashford at the business school that we've integrated in there. And it's cultivating courage through issue selling. We know from research, and when I was associate dean at the Ross School of Business, we know we did some research on why women weren't doing well in economics classes. And we knew that women like to prepare. And if you give them a model and a preparation rubric that helps them to excel, and therefore, whereas the men would come in and just wing the economics test. So I thought about this with regards to courageous issue selling and what kind of framework could we give women. So it starts with um, people are more courageous when you do your homework. You go in that room before time and you've done your homework. You understand the context, you have the data, you have a theory of change, you know best practices. The second phase of being courageous is about strategic storytelling, being prepared. Once again, remember I said authentic leaders can own the stage. Know the story you want to tell when you have a high state courageous decision. It then goes on, part of doing your homework is managing power in politics. There are power in politics in everything we do. And you know, we like to say there are no power in politics in universities, but we all know that's not true, right? So being able to manage the power in politics. And then timing matters. No one wants to hear anything the day before graduation or the day before the semester is about to end. So thinking about timing when you're going to make those courageous moves. And then a coalition of people. And you need all different types of people to empower you to be courage. You need honesty. You need support. Part of being courageous is you need that provocateur. You need that person who's always going to challenge you. Um, I always say to my team, don't treat me like the emperor with no clothes. Don't tell me everything I want to hear. I want you to be a provocateur so that I'm prepared to make those courageous moves. And then understanding the organizational culture. And what I also tell women is don't always go in with a problem and not have a solution. Be solution centric. Think about the change you want to see and have a pathway for action. Okay. Practice four. I think if the year 2020 and 2021, we've all had to learn how to foster resiliency. We've had to bounce back, we've had to reinvent ourselves, we've had to innovate. I've taken a different approach to resiliency. I've taken the approach of positive deviance. That resiliency is not just bouncing back, because we're going to have setbacks in life, but it's this notion that resiliency is going to make us better. We're going to evolve into something totally new. And this is what we think about in this practice. How do we create cultures where women can be resilient? So first of all, resiliency is hard work. In any crisis situation, we know we go through fear mode. And the fear mode looks like a variety of things. It's anxiety. It's denial, denial. It's paralysis analysis. It's myoptic. We lack emotional intelligence. It's being selfish. Now you're like, OK, Lynn, what's your proof point? My proof point is, how many of us hoarded toilet paper and paper towels during the pandemic? That's that fear mode that we all saw, right? We go into fear mode in a crisis situation. 
It's normal. We're biologically wired for this. But the question is, you have to give yourself grace, and you have to give yourself pause. And then you have to say, what do I have to learn for this new world order? We all had to learn new things. We had to acquire knowledge. We had to think about a theory of change. We had to plan. We had to prototype. And I often say, if my 85-year-old mother could learn new things during the pandemic, then all of us can learn things. When I said to her, my daughter was in boarding school and her graduation in 2020 was on Zoom. And my mother lives for graduations and events. And after I called, I said, well, mommy, what did you think about graduation? She said, I never want to go back to an in-person graduation. It was fabulous. I don't have to worry about parking. I don't have to worry about the bathroom. And I got a great seat. Right? This is someone at 85 who had to learn a whole new world in the middle of the pandemic. And so you have to ask yourself, if I'm going to be resilient, what do I need to learn? The final phase of resiliency is this growth mode. It's one thing to learn, but putting that learning in action, having a long-term review, establishing and creating new relationships, thinking about how you can innovate, Challenging yourself to do some stretch assignments. Um, Dory Clark says that 20% of our time should be stretch assignments, doing something new. So people ask me, you know, how did I publish and write books and stuff when my kids were young? Well, I have a seven-year gap. My daughter was a dancer, so she was in dance school all day Saturday. And so Saturdays, I would write books and papers. And that was a stretch assignment for me, but that was her way for me to innovate. And then thinking about growth mode is what's going to be a high payoff mentality. What do you want to do now, but also what do you want to do in the future? Um, for those of you who want to do a resiliency assessment um, on janesandwooten.com, we have a resiliency assessment. It's something good to do as an individual. There are tons of tools about resiliency and crisis leadership, but it's also a very good tool to do with your team to say, how are we positioned for resiliency post-pandemic? Inspiring a bold vision. You heard uh, my PhDs in corporate strategy. I know the university is going through a visioning process right now. Practice number five was so important, and my co-author, Janet Fowley at Deloitte, it's her favorite practice when we think about women arriving and thriving. Um, Tiffany Dufu is an entrepreneur. She's written the book, Drop the Ball. I think she's been here to speak um, at one of our women's conferences on the university. Tiffany says, to have vision is to say, I have an ideal of what the world needs that trumps what everyone else on the planet is doing. And in some ways, that a best ideal is to move us forward. And so she is the opening quote in the book. We also have a lot of research in the book about vision. And sadly to say, and we can all have our theories about this, the research shows that women are not perceived visionary. So a man can say an ideal in the room, and oh, it's, it's so great. It's a great vision. This is you know, brilliant. And for some reason, when the woman says the same thing, it's not perceived as visionary. And so part of us having practice number five is we wanted women to have tools to be visionary. And there are tons of great tools out there. Um, if you followed any of Zingerman stuff, that's some of my favorite ones about how to be vision. It's about the conversational pattern. But there are lots of ways to think about vision. One of the things I often say when I'm working with women is, is that vision is about what Tiffany Dufu said. What does the world need now? And then how do I tell the story around it? How do I innovate it? And there are three different ways to think about vision. One is, is that everyone should have a vision for their personal life and their professional life. And beyond that, if you're engaged in your community. And then there's the vision about how can you be agents of systems change? You know, each of the women in this audience today and our male allies, we play roles. And so what is the individual vision for your role? But what do you want to do for systems change? And then finally, one way to think about vision is visions are usually you repair something, you innovate, or you rethink something. But you have to be bold. You have to be big. You have to tell the story out there. Practice number six, and soon I'll be getting the questions. I want to have some dialogue and find out how I'm doing on time here. Creating a healthy team environment. So when I got into the academy, I was like, oh, this is going to be a great life. I just get to show up at work every day, write my papers, and teach my class. I don't have to be on a team. Well, that was a myth. And we know that great leaders lead great teams. And in fact, I, my number one job is really, I call it to actually be a mom, a manager of managers is to lead a great team. Now remember all of those leaky pipelines I showed you. 
women are falling out when they start to get to middle management, whether it be in higher ed or healthcare or the corporate sector. And part of the reason why they're falling out is, is because we need to invest in coaching them to lead great teams. So what does that take? It's all the other practices that we've been talking about and bringing them together at the team level. You have to be your best self, but you also have to create a team that is best self. So bringing the team strengths. You know, Jen Collins says a good leader gets the team on the right seats in the right bus. But beyond that also, you have to set a direction and strategy. Where is the team going? And a culture where the sum is greater than the parts. Good teamwork is frequent and honest communications. It's service excellence. It's making time for the team to learn together. It's appreciating the team. And it's ensuring that when the team makes mistakes, the leader owns it. Therefore, it's a psychologically safe culture. But early on, we have to give women responsibility for leading teams in our group projects, in our classrooms. We have to acknowledge, you know, I remember I used to, from my youngest, I used to always get these things about your daughter is bossy. And I wondered if I would get the same teacher comments if it was a guy or a boy. So creating the cultures in higher ed where women can step up is our responsibility, teaching them how to lead teams, whether it be in the athletic field, in the classroom, in the co-curricular, in the research lab. Finally, um, the seven practices, and it brings us back to the introduction, and part of this series is about diversity, equity, and inclusion, is doing the work of the inclusive leader. And each of us in this room today, I think just by being here, you're committed to it. We have a framework that we um, developed at Simmons about this, and there's a monograph you can get on the Kindle about it. You can go to the website. Um, but you're doing this already. I mean, UM is an exemplar for doing this, and I just want to summarize what it looks like. The work of the inclusive leader starts with knowing yourself and knowing your strengths. And when you know your strengths, you also know your bias. You have to know those unconscious biases. You have to create a value for equity. You have to understand that everyone's not the same and everyone needs different things. You've seen the equity picture before and what that looks like. But maybe where the real opportunity is, is level two and level three of inclusive leaders and how we turn around the she session. Partnering for success. People often ask me in allyship, is that, you know, did you have men mentors? Of course I had male mentors. Many reasons why I'm here is because I had many partners for success. My husband was my partner in support. Tim Johnson in OBGYN, John Trotman in social work, male department chairs such as Kim Cameron and Bob Quinn, male deans, lots of people got me here. And so we need partners, we need allies, we need cultures that also advocate for belonging. And we always have to say, who feels like they're not belonging here? And how can we change that so that they belong? I mean, you heard Andrea Norie talk about we need better child care. Well, we also know we need better elder care. We need lots of different things for belonging. And then becoming a change agent is about sponsoring other people. In the African American community, there's a saying, lift as you climb. That's what sponsorship's about. It's when someone else is not in the room that you're lifting them up, you're elevating them. You're looking to see, okay, do we have fair representation across gender roles? And then finally, making that systems change. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, this was in the Washington Post, and this was MIT. And this is, I think, an engineering professor, Domenico, that knew his lab could be more women friendly. And what did he do? He put a playpen in his lab. So his postdoc students could come in and do their work and watch their children at the same time. This is just the everyday leadership of system changes that all of us can do for gender equity. Okay. So what does that look like? It looks like, one, education institutions. It starts with us. Beyond the family unit, nobody has the way and the power to make sure that women have an environment to arrive and thrive. So educational institutions. We need the workplace, and of course we need government policies and practices. You know, we need to democratize leadership. We need a different form of leadership, I argue. We need collective impact, so we need to think about across sectors. We need movement makers. We also need to think about activism and having some of these courageous conversations for gender equity. Um, in conclusion, 
and many of you, I started with Crabble, Scrabble and Wordle. It's interesting that 2022, dictionary.com said that women was the word of the year. And it started when justice, um, um, when they were doing the Supreme Court justice hearings and someone asked Kentaji, how do you define women? And people started Googling women. But if women is going to be the 2022 word of the year, we all need changes. And we all have to be allies, we have to be bystanders, we have to ensure that not only the women in this room are arriving and thriving, but all of the women on this campus are. So how am I doing in time for question and discussions? How many minutes do I have? OK, so we have about, let's say, seven minutes. I, I want to hear your thoughts, your questions, your discussions, the dialogue, and then I'll close it up. Questions, discussions, best practices, yes. There seems to be a, a very organized pushback now against DEI, social emotional learning, wokeness. How do you see that factoring into the work that you do and that we need to keep doing? You know, the, yes, I will repeat the questions. You can hear me clearly though, right? Yes. She said there's a pushback on all the things that I've talked about today. There's the cancel culture. People don't like wokeness. Um, nobody, people have DEI fatigue, so what do we do about the pushback? You know, the pushback requires us to fight harder. We have to understand that this is something that we need in society, and we have to be almost what I call equity warriors. And so, because the people who are pushing back, they're fighting hard. And so we have to be in their faces also about the value proposition for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why it makes a difference, and exemplify the change we want to live. Right. Question there, and I'll repeat your question. Um, I, I was just here, I'm learning about some research from um, Menage and Google from Harvard, where they did the testing on implicit bias. Yes. And the, the, one of the things they were saying was that it's regional, that the discrepancies between men and women on um, the girls' voice on testing and on math seem to be most like it's, it's a cultural, it affects on a wider um, range than just individual or even within a company that sometimes in certain counties, certain places, yeah. their discrepancies are larger. So the conclusion is, is that creating that change is not just on an individual level, it's a broader thing. It kind of seemed a bit overwhelming to me. <laughs> that you are exactly right. When we think about the K-12 and the higher education system, it's built into the system. And it goes back to my slide that we need systems change. And I'm going to build upon what you said. So when we were at UM, to get into the Ross School of Business, you need microeconomics. And we couldn't figure out why our women students would come in with the same GPA and the same test score as men, but they weren't doing well in microeconomics. And it was a systems problem. It was the class was not designed to be a women's friendly class, the way they were teaching, the way they were testing. And when they changed the curriculum, we started to see the gender parity and performance in microeconomics. So each of us in our class has to, and, it, and, and some of the universities I'm working with, they're seeing the reverse now where men students are not thriving. So once again, we have to look at our classrooms and our labs and our systems to ensure that we are creating places where all people can thrive. And so a lot of this, the she session and what you just described, we need systems change. We, and we, and we, that's why we have to be these equity warriors. But we definitely see it in the K-12 system. I mean, I don't know how many times in my daughter's advanced math classes, she was, for the, her whole system from K through 12, the only woman of color in her advanced math classes. What does that say about how higher ed is failing us? And K-12. So that's a good thing about changing the systems. Those of us who are professors here, staff members, researchers, it's up to us. Yes. Stand up, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, so you mentioned that like, there's a need to democratize leadership and to ensure that changes that we have a collective impact. Do you think you could elaborate more on like, you know, what changes need to happen in organizations? Is it like an issue of them being too uh, hierarchical or intolerant of like, alternative views. Yeah, I think democratizing leadership, once again, this builds upon the last question. He said that I, did I get the right pronoun? Oh, I did. 
they, I'm sorry, they, they said, what does democratizing leadership mean? And what does that look like and why is that so important? Uh, part of my research is I talk about everyday leader. If we're going to make the change that I'm proposing, we need to throw hierarchical leadership in the trash. We need cultures, we need workplaces, we need systems where everybody has a voice. They're brought to the table. I strongly believe in collective and community decision making. And, and universities are great places to change how we do that and how that looks. And so that is so important that we have the systems change, but we're bringing everyone to the table. And we realize that it requires a diversity of opinions. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Jessica Calderon. Thank you for coming here. Um, have you ever struggled with imposter syndrome, like the first um, CEO that you presented? She said, I have to a seat at this table. What are some tips of overcoming that? Yeah. Um, I have a, co a colleague at INSEAD in France who was at Harvard Business School, and it's Hermina Abar. And her thing is, is that all of us struggle with imposter syndrome, and the key is you fake it until you can make it, right? Just fake it until you make it. And so whenever you take a new job, none of us have done it. I've never been a president of a university before. I've never been a dean before. But what I do is I consult with my personal board of directors. I develop role models. Even though I have never done something, there are other people who have done it. And I built transition teams to help to support me. Um, I've worked with executive coaches. I go home and get lots of feedback from my husband and children. But we all struggle with it. But like I said, I know that I can learn so I can read. The internet now, you can be anybody's friend on the internet. So what I did when I became president is, you know, I surrounded myself with 10 other presidents to learn that. Um, I surrounded myself with my board. I had a transition plan. I worked with a coach. I read tons of books. And admitting that fear, but then having that courageous framework that I showed you is how I navigated it. So, I think I have time for one more question. That one was imposter syndrome, and then I'll, you'll be the last one, and I'll wrap up. Hi, uh, there's a follow-up. Um, is there a short place online that you can send us to so that we can get academic men to do as much um, <laughs> service work as women? Yes. <laughs> yes. But, you know, that goes back again to the systems change, right? Even when we're looking at committee and service work, we need to say, okay, where are the men? And get them. And then we also need to reward the people. And we know that people of color and women are doing the service work. And so do we have systems that reward them for the work that we're doing? Right. So thank you for, I mean, it goes back to the systems change again. Um, my departing thought is this is my mother when she graduated from college. She was a first generation student and college changed her life. This is me when I graduated from high school and now my daughter's a junior at Brown. I, um, I had the opportunity to spend time with Gloria Steinian when I left the book and her quote is, progress is not automatic, but it depends on what we do every day. Um, my final story is um, I work out of Ann Arbor some weeks, and I'm working out of Ann Arbor this week, and I decided that I was going to get all my doctor appointments done at the UM. And my last doctor appointment on Monday, there was a young female doctor there, and I said, tell me about yourself. And she said, I went to undergrad at University of Michigan Dearborn, and it transformed my life. And then she said she went on to medical school at the U, and she talked about her Dearborn experience and how that made her who she was. And that just made my day to see a young female doctor from Dearborn, and this is the progress we're all trying to do so we can arrive and thrive in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you.